There we go. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started um, and just give a little bit of background. So if for those of you who might not um, remember why we're doing what we're doing and where we're going. Um, so we're going to we're going to go through that. Then we're going to say where we are. We're going to share a little bit about the schematic design, where we landed, why we landed there. Then we want to hear what you all think from a perspective of what we need more of in the community, um, what we also um, uh, would be helpful for our space use groups. And then we're going to share a little bit about like how we're going to make this all happen. Um, and we're going to do that from two perspectives, both from the architectural plans perspective and also from the funding perspective. So um, we're going to get us started um, going into where we have been. And so this whole journey started um, back in uh, 2018. And so um, you can see in the pictures on the screen here, right behind me um, here in person, there used to be a stage. And at that point, we had a really, really bad flood. Water was coming in from uh, the south side of the building here. It flooded under the, the stage. It required us to pull up some old asbestos tiles, which meant remediation of asbestos. Um, it meant then um, trying to get at all of the water damage that was there. We waterproofed the south side of the building and the uh, west side of the building. Um, and as we were standing here and we tore out this stage, we kind of started saying, so do we rebuild the stage? Do we not? What, what do we want to do? And we realized we kind of needed a longer term plan so that as catastrophes happen, and hopefully no more will be, uh, but as they do happen, we know how we want to respond to that and what we want to go with. And for more long term, we can also have an understanding of where we want to go. And so um, if at that 2018 point was kind of, we had done, we had taken care of a lot of the known big problems when the chimney collapsed and when bricks were falling on people walking by um, from the tower. And when we had um, all sorts of um, different issues um, in the building, we kind of our hail damage on the top, we kind of took care of all that, and now we want to be more proactive um, as our congregation was growing and we were feeling um, more stable as a community. So with that, we began in 2019. We held um, not only for the congregation, but also for space use groups. And we said, tell us what you want in this space. And so we held um, a variety of different meetings and we compiled large lists of what everybody was kind of looking for, what they were hoping and dreaming for um, in the community um, from things like um, better kitchen space and things for our space use groups and more flexibility and, and uh, acknowledging that you know, we've got a big, beautiful space down here, but sometimes, you know, when there's a small group like this, you don't need a huge space. Um, and at the same time, we've got like, you know, some of the book club in the other room, and you can really hear the sound flow. So what are the ways that we can separate some of the, and put in more sound barriers, have more small subdividable community space? Um, and we were often turning away a lot of groups. And some of you um, who are here with us today know that sometimes we're like, no, sorry, we don't have room um, because we only really have two spaces, two floors to work with. And so by subdividing this, it's going to allow us an opportunity um, to better right size rooms, um, which helps with um, our carbon footprint and other things, as well as um, making sure that we can offer more community space. So uh, with that, then we took all that information that you all gave us in 2019, and uh, we interviewed a variety of different architecture firms, and we decided to go with Blender Architecture Firm right here in Chicago. They helped us kind of put all of this information together, looking at it in different categories, understanding kind of how we're going to begin this process of moving together. We also began looking at things um, like programming. So what are all the different spaces that we have? How many people um, are in those spaces? What our hopes and dreams are um, for those different spaces and sizings? We did preliminary reviews where we went to the city of Chicago already. They looked at everything. We looked at ingress, egress. So how, how people are coming in, how people are going out and say like a fire or emergency. They reviewed it to see if we needed to get a sprinkler system. Uh, spoiler alert, we don't. Um, and then they went along and and, and help to make sure that we were going to be moving in the right direction for the whole process. Um, so in 2020, right before the pandemic happened, we had come down to these kind of two plans. They were looking at a couple different things. One was, uh, one big thing is really where the elevator is located. So you've got um, the elevator um, in A, which would be kind of in the Hoyne and Lemoyne corner. Um, so um, if you're in person, it's that way, um, but it's down um, right at the corner. And then B was kind of putting it on the other side there. 
Right. And so, so right now we're not accessible at all. So you can't get in um, on uh, right from the ground level. You immediately have to go up or down stairs or you have to walk upstairs to get in the building. That's a really important point. None of our bathrooms are ADA accessible. Um, so there's no accessibility. It's a 1906 building. And so, you know, 1906, we weren't thinking in that same way as we are now. Um, so we paid even more money to really test this out. And they brought in a more architects and engineers to kind of look at it because ideally the best place to put it is at the Hoyne Lemoyne corner. It's right at the corner. It's the, the primary location and it would just make sense for it to be right at the corner. Um, as they started looking at those two schemes, really what, what, what it comes down to is that this scheme of pointing it at, at the corner of Hoyne and Lemoyne right here, A, we've got this whole box right here is the south tower and that is all like load bearing and so we were going to have to cut some pretty major holes into a load bearing structure um and then on top of that once you get that in there wasn't going to be the ada accessible um height head height room that you needed to come in from ground level given the existing conditions at that corner um it also was going to mean that we we're gonna have to kind of rework some stairs the elevator shaft would actually go up into the sanctuary so it would block um one of the uh, the windows in that corner and in the end as much as we wanted it to fit there and we explored everything possible it just wasn't going to work to actually be an ada accessible entrance that was going to work well for our community so we did end up landing on design Design B, which is now putting it on the north side of the building, so northeast side of the building, so the fellowship hall upstairs on that far, on that side closest to the street is where that kind of ended up being. So in the midst of all that, COVID happens. And then the city came after us and said, you need a water meter. We couldn't put in the water meter because we had a lead supply line. Then they started finding us and finding us and adding all these things. So $20,000 uh, $20, worth of bills we racked up uh, when nobody was in the building using any water. Um, and so what they said we needed to do is we needed to replace that, that lead water supply line. So we did a fundraising campaign for our gathering garden and water supply line. We did get that right sized water supply line in. So we don't have to do that again. It's the right thing um, for, for these building projects. We put that line in, we put this beautiful gathering garden in, um, and we're still um, dealing with the legal uh, people trying to get that, get that $20,000 to go away, even though we don't pay a dollar um, for water these days. Um, so then we came to you all earlier this year in 2023, and we had landed on um, a, a plan that we had heard the most energy around from those meetings back um, in, or no, 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 this was the meeting where we gathered after um, we had finished an initial master plan design process or comprehensive building plan. And we got your feedback in 2023. Today, I'm gonna invite um, Jonathan to talk us through where we are. So we heard all your feedback in early 2023. Um, we had multiple congregation meetings. We had a neighbor meeting. We also had space use group meetings. We took all that feedback and then what you're seeing in the plan today is coming from those meetings earlier this year and that will propel us forward. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan and let him do his part. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, so I think one of the first things to note here, uh, oh, that's very suspenseful. Uh, so I think one of the first things to note is that what's being proposed puts no new windows and no new doors into the building. So everything that's existing on the outside remains the same. Aesthetically, the building remains the same. Um, other than enhancing the existing windows so that they're more energy efficient, they will aesthetically look the same. Everything from the street uh, remains untouched virtually um, and aesthetically. So with that, uh, if we're looking at the street, this is uh, the plan on the page is street level. So you can see the gathering garden marked with the number one. And then number two would be this first phase. And so currently there is an existing door on the northeast corner of the building. Uh, that door is already existing. It already has a staircase that leads down to it. It's not used heavily. Um, but really identifying where our locations are, uh, as, as Jason kind of said, where are locations in the building that we could put this lift. And so um, without trying to add anything to the outside uh, and without adding a ramp, which would be uh, just if, briefly studying it, the ramp has to be, you know, 75 feet long, something astronomical like that, aesthetically impacting the building, uh, adversely affecting the street. Um, and so we kind of ruled that out very quickly. And then we looked at where, where could this be located? So 
Uh, on this northeast corner, some of the benefits to here are that door is existing. Uh, and, and what can we do to make this kind of a, a, an entry point? We want to be respectful of our neighbors. So uh, using signage, using uh, kind of wayfinding, and using the same aesthetic that we have in the gathering garden, uh, having this as an accessible entrance. This would be the main entrance, uh, off hours for deliveries, things like that. Uh, and anybody that needs to use a, uh, an accessible entrance, uh, this would be that entrance. We would still be using the other entrance at the Hoyne and Lemoyne corner as well. Uh, but on the lower level, this is where it gets kind of... This is still going with the, the sanctuary concerts. Yeah, thank you. Yes, of course. So the main entrances, the two doors uh, off of the sanctuary, off of the narthex, those are still existing, still open, still the primary entrance and exits, uh, you know, whenever there's functions in the building. Uh, and I think that that's worth noting just because we do have so many doors. And so when we kind of looked around this plan and when we started to get into this, you know, controlling circulation and access points uh, for security reasons inside the building uh, and for a logical usage for people uh, intuitively wayfinding as they come into the building, uh, delineating those entrances and making it logical so that when you're visiting, uh, you can find the room that you're going to. And for our user groups, that's really important. Uh, but yes, Jason, of course. So uh, all the entrances remain the same. So we really think on Sunday mornings, nothing's going to be that different other than we will have a, uh, a door that's accessible uh, for people to go up and down from. Uh, so starting on that corner, and I don't know if you can see the mouse. Um, so starting on the corner, this would be the entrance point. Uh, there'd be a lift immediately off of that. And then there would be a staircase up and a staircase down. So going up, that obviously takes you to the sanctuary level. Going down, it takes you to the uh, lower level here. Uh, immediately off of that, we would have the main office space for the church. Uh, this is great because uh, for functionality for, for the congregation right now, uh, Pastor Jason's kind of tucked away in the back. All the office functions are tucked away in the back. Um, again, it's it's hard to maintain uh, security, knowing who's coming in and out of the building, being so removed from that. So centrally locating this office, uh, intuitively, when you come down the stairs, this would be a large glass entrance into the uh, receptionist area. So a lot of eyes on what's happening inside the building. Uh, coming down into that, this would be a multi uh uh, use bathroom. So this is all the bathrooms, much like we currently have functioning um, gender neutral bathrooms and trying to make these, uh, you know, this is kind of a, a, a neat thing, but, you know, two entrances on either side, you'd be able to flow in and out. Um, these are not like the bathrooms now. These are full height doors, full height partitions, uh, and really open and usable to uh, anyone and being a warm and welcoming environment. And so that was really important to us, but also being a safe uh, kind of way to do that. Uh, immediately across the way from that is the uh, family restroom. So that would have a shower, baby changing station, um, toilet, of course. And then we would also potentially have a washer dryer located near there uh, to kind of serve the functionality for the church and for some of the user groups. Uh, then we kind of have this main corridor down the center, what we're calling the main street. And so off of this main street, are the main uh, main meeting rooms. And so right now, what's shown as meeting room seven over here in purple, this is a partition that is movable down the middle. So consider these three different meeting rooms of different capacities, and I have the numbers here. Uh, so when this partition is open, we're looking at roughly 80 seats, potentially more depending on the configuration. Uh, and then we've gone through and studied those user groups. So as Jason mentioned previously, uh, you know, we, we looked at who uses these spaces and what are the optimal numbers for them. And we can kind of circle back on that, uh, just because I think that'll be an important one for everybody. Um, oh, cool. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, take a look at that because this north room here, we're looking at roughly 30 seats, 32 seats, uh, 36 seats in this room. So really, that's kind of the sweet spot number looking at the different groups. And of course, you know, this is for uh, for laying out rooms, but you know, there's different ways to lay out rooms and different ways to kind of get to those numbers. Um, but this is really after talking to all the different groups, talking to the congregation, the numbers that made the most sense for us to break up these spaces. Uh, immediately to the north of this large meeting room, we would have a commercial kitchen. Uh, this would have access to these meeting rooms, which we think is going to be very functional for everybody. Um, and then, of course, down here, and then we have a designated nursery space. So even potentially off hours, this could be a space where uh, children are supervised and kind of having, uh, you know, going back and forth, looking at the, the things that a children's space needs, 
um, this would have toys and things like that. We wouldn't have to put them away. We wouldn't have to take them out. It wouldn't be an inconvenience to our user groups by trying to get that functionality into another space and kind of doing that double duty. Uh, as we move up into the building to the sanctuary level, uh, this is where, you, you know, looking at how we get this elevator in, there was really no way to do this without impacting some part of the building. And after the initial study that Pastor Jason mentioned earlier, really that would have impacted the sanctuary space, which was something that was, uh, you know, we, we entertained because we put all options out on the table, but also something that we didn't necessarily want to do as a congregation. But also looking at, again, those cost factors and looking at how this space could be used uh, it, it was just very, very quickly realized that going to this northeast corner made the most sense for the lift. Uh, and so what you see up here is we've added a uh, a, a public restroom behind this lift. Uh, and so right now, probably most people aren't even aware, in Pastor Jason's office, there's a small inaccessible restroom. But currently, if you're on this level, on the fellowship level, sanctuary level, you have to, you know, traverse stairs to get to a usable restroom, which is obviously something that... Uh, being an open church, uh, an accessible church, we wanted to, to rectify with this renovation. So not only adding a lift for access, but adding usable restrooms to every level that are accessible kind of off these public corridors. Uh, so the fellowship hall, when you ascend the stairs, you'd have the top of the elevator, this public restroom, and then you would enter the fellowship hall much like it is today, but it, we would be carving out some of the space that's there. Um, one of the things that we're also adding here is, is doors so that that fellowship hall can be usable um, for a group without impacting the rest of the spaces. And I think that that's important because this is one more meeting space that we have within the building. Um, again, it's, it's a little bit smaller than what is currently there. But as we've studied this, as, as you're all probably aware, you know, we store a lot of things in that space currently. And so with this renovation, we would be adding a storage room off to the side of that. So all those tables, all those chairs, all those things that are out there um, could be stored away off to the side. Uh, and this space would hopefully be even more usable uh, with some of the other things that we're looking at there. So those things being, uh, we're looking at a, uh, a sink, uh, potentially a refrigerator, condiment station, a hard piped uh, coffee maker, things like that. So this becomes another space that's really hospitable for use uh, for different user groups and for the congregation on Sunday mornings. Uh, behind that, uh, looking at the existing office space, this would be turned into a sacristy. So this would be robe storage, things like that uh, to serve the congregation, um, as well as some of the bell towers getting uh, renovated to allow for more storage. Uh, up here on the choir loft, this, uh, if, if you've been up there, it currently has a few tiers to it. We would be looking at leveling this out to make it a more usable space, uh, whether that eventually becomes a space for uh, a choir or it becomes a meeting space and off hours, things like that. But again, you know, another space that is usable for different groups, uh, potentially, uh, in addition to the congregation is just another, another venue. Jason, is there anything that you wanted me to circle back on? Cause I kind of went through that quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the other item here in the sanctuary, what's noted here is currently uh, in the sanctuary space, you know, we have a few steps. It's tiered up as it goes to the altar. Uh, we don't know exactly what this is going to look like, but we wanted to uh, allude to it here that we, we do have intents and plans to make that accessible as well. So what's currently shown here is, is ramps that go up and kind of move up to the altar. Uh, again, that impacts the sanctuary. So we're kind of considering it another conversation with the congregation as that is a sensitive area. Um, but it is something that is in the plan to make all spaces within the church uh, accessible and usable to all groups. Uh, so that is a very good note. Uh, the, yeah, absolutely. So the color coding here, that's what you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. So the color coding uh, pertains to the phasing of these different items. and we broke this down a few different ways. And on a lot of the grants that we've, um, you know, applied for, we, we needed to understand, you know, what is the cost for each phase? Uh, and then how, what needs to happen in order for something else to happen? So all in, this is a very expensive project. Um, and how can we break this apart if we only achieve funding for a certain portion? So what would be the most critical parts? So the gathering garden, uh, that first slide that I was on was phase one. That is already complete. That is already done. We've already raised the money for that, which is fantastic. So you can chalk this one off. Uh, phase two would be the lift and adding the stair. We think that this is most critical because of 
uh, the impact that it has on the other levels also as a um, um, immediate uh, impact on the space, right? This immediately makes it accessible for everyone uh, to enjoy the lower level and the upper level, which as previously mentioned, nobody can get to uh, unless you can ascend and descend stairs. Uh, immediately after that is phase three. This would be the windows. Uh, we do think that there might be an opportunity to break this apart into other segments, but looking at it, this this would be the only phase that impacts uh, the exterior of the building. And again, that would just be replacing the existing windows, uh, identical looking, but much more energy efficient. Uh, and again, if push comes to shove, perhaps we can we can break this phase out too. Uh, but just knowing that we're going to touch every one of these spaces, the thought was it, doing this first before kind of going through and changing these other spaces. Uh, part three would be the restrooms uh, and these meeting rooms in this larger portion. The logic there being, uh, you know, we need to uh, do the plumbing. The infrastructure for the plumbing is obviously all underground. So doing that phase uh, in concert with the uh, the kitchen off to the side immediately after, we would, it, it, if we don't achieve our goals, we would be able to stub in for the kitchen uh, and temporarily have a space, even if it's not the fully functional commercial kitchen, but at least we would have a uh, accessible uh, restroom uh, to go with the accessible uh, entrance and getting people down. This would also immediately get us some defined spaces uh, in the basement for user groups to use. Uh, and I think that that's important just because, you know, right now, as as you all have your groups within the space, you know, one of the challenges is uh, this basement is a lot of area and a lot of space, but it's not defined. And so it's hard to have groups use this space uh, concurrently with other groups. And I guess that's also a good time to note that, you know, with all these plans, we have an eye to how do we make it acoustically separated? How do we make it functional so that groups can occupy, you know, neighboring rooms uh, at the same times or even, you know, passing each other uh, so that we get the most usage of the space and the most uh, opportunities for people to use this space. Uh, and so that's a consideration as we go through this. And certainly as we start to go through more of the construction details and things like that at later phases, um, you know, making sure that a group using on, uh, on the on the sanctuary level is not affect, affecting a group on the lower level is, is kind of one of the big goals here. Uh, so then with that, uh, the other phases, uh, later on, we would be doing the large meeting room, uh, and then we would be doing the office space uh, as well. So those relate to those, and I'll let Jason kind of touch on the the funding if we want to get into that uh, and how that relates to each one of these spaces. The only thing that I, I might add um, for the window, it does go kind of feel the world. You might have seen that there are two window, old window, space world problems that are affordable. The intent of the contract is to restore those windows that they're no longer affordable. And so that would be the reason that this would be in the year. So it's not adding new windows and doors, but we're just returning them to what we're doing. But uh, just to name that, and you guys are going to be alone with that. It's your point. This is our audience. I know. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing with all of the windows is, um, and, and you probably wouldn't know this very well, but they have these great sounds that are uh, actually, when we've gone back and looked at short pictures, were not original. And so our intent is we still want to keep them for keeping the space big, but we're actually going to restore them to something that it looks a little bit, it might. You know, take on the characters of the very general building. Maybe it's like defense posts, right? And, and, and so still the people put it right through them to get into the building, but they would kind of be more not just physically and not have this like like some of these early babies kind of like they go. Uh, so that would be another thing that we see. And you also can imagine um like the only thing about uh, the only window that is see through basically probably right now. All the rest of them are kind of uh fronts in the intent would be to actually make them all through. Which would allow a lot more light in it, but also just kind of uh, when you think about the gathering there in the front and other spaces, kind of with this loud space and kind of go in together and it will feel like it's inside and outside because there's some big, beautiful windows that they put in down there. Uh, it doesn't feel like a basement, but to also open that up and clear that. So 
I imagine as well, I'm going to comply with some things like that, we'll get some kind of lines and stuff like that. Um, you know, like that. One of the main goals in the class, so I think those are really the only class that we have you all as neighbors is yeah. having, you know, putting the windows and not the really windows in the store. And actually, when, the, when they tore the, when they tore the wall down, to put the, um, uh, water, the, the window is different. Uh, they're still in there, they're more than one top of So, uh, I guess we're just putting the board now, and we're placing the gap. Uh, so it's nothing new, um, with that, and then restoring the clear glass and making them come up to, um, there. Yeah, just one of the neighbors. You know, that side of the building, you probably could have gone a little bit. One of the main, uh, really, uh, <laughs> and your population of Lima are a little bit, which is awful. Yeah, we can check that anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, online, can can you hear uh, Pastor Jason's comments? Not yes. very well. <laughs> Not very well. Got it. Coming uh, in and out a little bit. The comment was essentially there's two windows here that are uh, currently boarded up as this is, you know, testing memory if you're not in the room. This is currently the kitchen space right here. Uh, and this is the restroom and the boiler room in the back. So there's two windows here that are boarded up. Uh, there's windows currently in them. Uh, but they would be uncovered and opened up and restored uh, to let more light into these meeting rooms uh, in the back. Uh, I think one of the other things uh, that I didn't touch on previously was was in this Main Street concept, uh, the, the relationship to the Gathering Garden, which Pastor Jason mentioned a minute ago, you know, with restoring all these windows and, and kind of creating the transparency to the street, there's a lot of visual connection that we think is going to be great for the neighborhood, as well as the, the groups inside and kind of communicating the activities that happen here at night. Um, you know, and the things that occur in here and the activities uh, and having eyes on the street as well as eyes from the street into the church uh, and just, you know, showing that this is a community space uh, and a space that is usable for for lots of different people and an active part of this neighborhood and this community. Um, that being said, they will have, you know, shades on them uh, to be drawn if, uh, you know, user groups need to have privacy as well. But certainly, you know, we think that there's uh, a, a, a great opportunity there to kind of show that connectivity to the neighborhood and also um, kind of connect people. Uh, with this with this kind of main corridor down the center, uh, we've also thought about this as a pre-function space. So, so what you see with the layout here is just kind of showing how tables could be set up down the center of that space. Uh, and really, you know, this is, if, if all these rooms are in use for a particular function, uh, you know, we think about it in terms of, you know, Sunday school or vacation Bible school or something like that. Uh, you know, picking up a t-shirt or picking up your name tag or whatever and using the space. But, you know, thinking about how this can be used for lots of different other functions um, and how this can kind of be an accessory, uh, an accessory space to these other spaces. Um, so certainly one of tables set up all the time. This would probably be soft seating, things like that. So if you're waiting to use a room, or if you're, you know, meeting people beforehand, this would be kind of those breakout spaces that in addition to these meeting rooms, uh, you could have groups potentially use these other soft seating areas around the, the first floor of the church. Up here? Yeah, so... And right here, yeah. So, so you know, anywhere that you see these kind of corridors outside of the meeting rooms, the idea is that those would be opportunities for for soft seating and things like that. And up here, uh, along the windows that are facing the gathering garden, you know, we think that there's, uh, you know, the opportunity to create kind of built-in millwork, casework that has benches, but also potentially storage for different groups uh, that use these spaces. Um, and I guess on that note, you know, what's shown here is all these storage rooms. Uh, to move tables, chairs, and also, you know, if, even if what we haven't really shown here is being able to divide these and have individual locks on them for different groups, potentially, in addition to this space, you know, if, if you're a recurring user of these rooms, you know, maybe maybe that gets associated with that space. Um, and then you don't have to move things, haul things in and out. So we're, we're really trying to 
uh, optimize the space uh, for everybody that you, uh, in addition to ourselves in the congregation, but everybody that you know uses the space and calls it home. We wanna we wanna make this as as friendly and hospitable to everyone. Uh, any questions on that? Feedback. I think oh, feedback. feedback's good too. Yeah. yeah. This is the open feedback. Yeah, I guess this is a good opportunity to uh, you know say all comments are welcome. Uh, this is by no means uh, set in stones, but this is kind of our uh, our best foot forward at this moment. And it's kind of you know we're, when we've looked at the design process, it's about. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of different levers to pull and they all have different reactions. And so what we were trying to find was the best mixture of inputs and outputs. So which are the levers that we can pull that kind of give the greatest results to everyone involved? And, and certainly, you know, there's there's bigger moves that we could have made that would have benefited the congregation, but would have been, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily great for our, our space futures partners uh, and vice versa. There would have been decisions that we probably could have made um, that could have been made that would have been, uh, you know, optimizing the space more for outside groups. But we wanted to find that right balance uh, between what are the, the the functions for everyone within this space. But that being said, we would love to hear comments. If you don't feel the same way, or if there's just you know things that you think that uh, you know could be enhanced or could be reconsidered or um, you know just kind of looked at more, or or maybe there's something we didn't occur. For instance, at one of our one of our meetings, somebody mentioned you know if we're having funerals here, is there uh, is the lift large enough for a casket or something like that? Uh, it is not, and so that would still be something that we'd have to deal with the same way. Um, but it was a great comment, just in the sense that we had you know that that had not been fully discussed with our group. I think especially side lane spacing for the space. Spacing. Yeah, so, so like this is an attachment to the um yeah it's online it's a whole bunch of thick lens okay cool. Okay, cool. So one of the uh, documents that you have access to is the furniture layout document. And what we did here was break down uh, different seating arrangements and how many seats uh, and how many tables you could uh, comfortably configure within each of these spaces. And we wanted to do that breakdown because we know that there are different groups uh, that configure the spaces in different ways. And we wanted to kind of demonstrate uh, how, how everyone's needs can be met um, and how we can facilitate these things. So, you know, flip through that. We have, uh, you know, U-shaped meeting rooms, presentation meeting rooms. Uh, round table configurations, um, and a lot of that is based off of the table sizes that we already have. Uh, but you know, as this project goes on and as we look at things, uh, different furniture is definitely going to be kind of acquired by the church in order to to work for these spaces too. What do you all think? What works, but does it work? Sure. Sure. What would um, the process be like? I, there are different phases, but for the groups that are already here, would they be impacted during construction? We certainly know that construction can go a lot longer than we think. And just this doesn't the way to us, the neighbors, but just thinking about who we can do with the food. Well, yeah, absolutely. And Pastor Jason, do you want to come up here to kind of talk about some of those too? So, so the question posed, and especially for those of you online, um, you know, as we begin construction, what does it look like for um, us to uh, continue to offer space um, for our, our space use groups and what does that look like? And so um, in a little bit, we're going to talk about how we're going to need to phase this out for a bit. We know that in our next phase, we're definitely, so we kind of had to chronologically go through all the different projects in order, as Jonathan was talking about, based on plumbing and electrical and all these different things that we could go on and on and on about, but we won't unless you ask us to. Um, and so our, our next phase will probably be um, a part uh, part two here, which includes the outside portion. And then 
the associated windows in of part three, and then this central bathroom area is what we, and I'm going to get into the funding um, just in a minute, reasonably think that we're going to be able to fundraise for this portion based on our feasibility study. So we're not going to be able, we're not going to do the whole thing all at once, which hopefully will mean that we can get creative with, you know, plastic barriers and other barriers that we can still have some pockets. It will really mean for our space use users to, to be understanding and flexible with that. And we're going to try our very best to be overly communicative and tell you about timelines. Right now, um, what it's kind of looking at is that we wouldn't begin this until late, late 2024 slash early 2025 the actual construction component, because now we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty of design development process, moving into permitting. We've got to get through that. We've got to get through the fundraising portion. So we're still probably at least a year away from construction. But once we do get to that phase, um, we want to try to be mindful of that. And also knowing that we're not going to be able to do it all at once will hopefully help balance that so that by the time we get to, like, say, the large meeting rooms over here and the kitchen, we've at least got these couple ones done and upstairs still. And so um, while spaces might get a little bit smaller, we'll still have the same number of spaces during the process. They just might not be the same size um, during that process. Is that kind of helping? <laughs> Let's see here. We got a few things here. Caleb is looking good. We're very excited about benefits to accessibility in particular. Um, Caleb says our group primarily uses the sanctuary and occasionally the fellowship hall. It'd be great to know more about how the sanctuary access will be impacted by the construction phases. Yeah, great, great question, Caleb. Um, I imagine, um, and I, I don't know for sure, so this is all just my personal conjecture. I mean, at, we're always going to have these front entrances to the sanctuary open. Um, right now for this next phase, we're not going to be able to get that accessibility towards the front of the, of the sanctuary, nor are we going to get um, anything on this end of the fellowship hall. So we're imagining that this fellowship hall portion is all going to be the same here. There is that additional door right here. So I could imagine this continuing to be open, even if we're needing to um, close off that, that east end of the fellowship hall while they're doing construction there. Um, eventually then, you know, that will be um, opened back up again, but I, I don't think that we foresee any major impacts to the sanctuary during this next phase, um, and the Fellowship Hall will still likely be partially usable. What I would say for all of that when we're talking about this next phase <clears throat> Um, as we get into um, uh, some of the, the next parts, we have submitted for a variety of grants. I'm going to tell you a little bit about those. We haven't heard from some of them. We've heard from some of them. If we were to get some of these major ones that we've put in through the city, um, then that's going to accelerate what we're able to do. So if we can do all eight of them, then we're going to try to do it in a way that we can re respect the groups that we have and try to do it as quickly as possible. That's also going to cut down on our costs for mobilization and other things if we're kind of doing larger chunks um, all at once. Once. However, um, if we aren't able to get that, what, what we're kind of, we're stepping into this next phase saying, we're going to assume that we're not going to get any of those. Once we get the word that we have gotten some of those or parts of them, then that's going to add additional um, phasing on. So that's where like the numbers that we talked through before um, are, are really important um, so that you can see on this side here, the scope grouping um, with that. And I, it's just kind of doing its own thing now. So um, I don't know where we're going, but um, so where we're going to go kind of all the way to four right now, if we get more money, we're going to move to five or six. Um, and some of that will be dependent upon the grants that we put in, for example, do not cover anything related to the church. We have said that we're going to fund all of that. So like office space doesn't go into the grant. Sacristy doesn't go into the grant. Um, our, all of the storage spaces don't, but some of the public spaces do. And so that will kind of impact it, but we're, we're committed to communicating about that through the process. Does that kind of help Caleb a little bit? Yeah, thank you. That's super helpful. And just to generally thank for being so responsive and, and focused on community impact. We're really grateful for this. Yeah. We're grateful to have, have you all and all of your awesome concerts. And um, when you're kind of imagining Caleb and, and, and others um, looking at this, any kind of thoughts that you're having, especially like things that were like missing, because we're not in the operations of your groups of kind of how you function and how you how you utilize the building. Are there things that we're missing? Because I, I think that's where we're really trying to make sure that like, is it going to work for most as we get further along in this process? Um, as we get into the next phase, which is D and D, changing these general blocks and ideas 
cost us more and more every time because we have to actually go backwards and pay architects and engineers and all those people to redo things. And so the more that we can kind of do do our best to kind of get it right and we know we're going to have to go back a little bit at different points but if we can avoid that it's going to help us go further in the long run to kind of get it all done so i'd love to hear yeah caleb or or um cc or any others about um feedback on it either positive or constructive for us i'll say generally i'm i'm really excited about all of this as i said in the chat the accessibility considerations are a priority for our organization so i'm so pleased about that um you know since the sanctuary is largely unchanged i think we have sort of fewer concerns about how the adjustments impact what we're used to using the space for um you know the slightly smaller fellowship hall maybe makes us think about instead utilizing lower level space for the times when we would use the fellowship hall um so the fact that there's those larger meeting spaces still but just in a different part of the building um could be an adjustment for us but i don't foresee an issue there um and also really love the opportunity to have child care or family space um we're thinking about expanding considerations for people with children for our programming and so we could really imagine use, utilizing that as well so mostly for me just a lot of affirmation um no major red flags so thanks so much yeah beautiful and, and I think that that's really a key thing that you brought up, Caleb. I mean, even even for us as a congregation, we're having to kind of reimagine how we're using the space, especially with the fellowship hall shrinking. And that's why we wanted to get this information out to groups earlier rather than later, so that as we start saying, okay, construction is going to be beginning, you can start thinking in your mind how you might be able to utilize space. But if you imagine like the larger room with like nicer carpet in it and nice like acoustic ceiling tiles and air conditioning downstairs and, um, you know, subdividable heating downstairs and, you know, newer, newer walls and um, stuff like that. Um, we're hoping that, you know, the fellowship hall people always really love because it's like warm and inviting and stuff like that. And we're hoping that we can bring that downstairs as well through, through the windows and the floors and the ceilings. And so that it can make all the spaces as, as inviting um, to that. So even if it is those small shifts and how we operationally use it, it can still be um, as community building as um, it, it's been for many of our groups using the fellowship hall upstairs. Just one last thing I'll say right now is I appreciate the thought around the acoustic reality of the building. You know, as a performing arts organization, as a music making organization, we think a lot about sound traveling. And so there have been times when we've had to adjust our usage when there's other groups in the building just for sound purposes. So that uh, thought of having acoustically separate spaces is also great and important for us. Yeah. That's really helpful to hear. And so, you know, in, in the spaces down here, we're imagining, you know, um, a drop ceiling with some acoustic tiles, um, and then also having carpet likely in all of those rooms downstairs, which will absorb some more of it. Um, we also, you know, we, we talked long and hard about like, do we put another dividing wall like here, or do we make it so that we can have larger spaces? And we kind of decided that this one subdividable space, the reality is, is that those dividing walls, no matter how much you pay for them, aren't always 100% great. Um, but um, And you can get the really cheap ones that like don't do anything, and they are just there as a physical barrier. And so we did decide to go with actual walls here that are going to allow us to kind of bulk up um, for that sound transfer. And even by putting this um, closet in here, now if you pack other things inside the closet, it's going to help with um, the, the sound transfer. But then we're going to sink a good amount of money into this barrier here so that you can actually use these two rooms um, side by side and minimize the, the sound travel in there. And so. Um, Hopefully that, you know, if you're thinking about like, oh, like, you know, we, we want to have uh, the common pulse, like actually use one of these rooms for choral purposes instead, because sometimes a, a dead end space can help for practices. Um, we're kind of trying to imagine those things as well um, for that. And CC, I see, so she put down um, ADA entry will be a huge impact for the community. It's awesome. 
Yeah, it's so sad, you know, and I get, we get contact with candlelight concerts that are here. People will call all the time about that. Um, for the congregation, baptisms and weddings, you know, to not have great grandma or grandma be able to get in the building for these moments is, is really sad. Um, but then you also have things like concerts and recitals and all these other things that, um, you know, individuals, not even those who are older, but we have, you know, people in the congregation who it's like, you know, mom was out skiing and now she sprained her ankle and now she's in crutches and all this. Other, and so she can't even get in to see her kids. And so, um, um, it's going to have huge impacts. We can also think about, um, for our congregation and some of our groups, strollers, right? Uh, earlier today, I met with a group uh, with uh, a couple, um, and we were their, their son was sleeping in the stroller, and we were trying to carry him up carefully up all the front steps when you could just roll him into an elevator and take him upstairs so much easier. So um, we really think that those ADA impacts will have, have um, wide-ranging impacts, not only to those um, who are in wheelchairs, but also those um, across a wide variety of ages. Before I move into the funding portion and where we are with that, I just want to ask one last time, any other feedback, comments, questions, concerns, um, things to, to name at this point? So Nora's typing all of this stuff up for our task force so we can bring it back to the architect and make sure that we've got it all covered. I'll just add one. Oop, I think you're muted again, Caleb. Sorry, just one tiny additional comment is that we love the existing tiered altar area um, for performances that is really just good for visibility and sound and things like that. So um, I'm happy to see that there's plans to make that space also accessible. Um, but just to say, we really like the tiers. Um, so like flattening that, you know, would be a detriment to us, but it doesn't look like that's in the plans, um, rather just the accessibility considerations. Yeah. And, and with that, we haven't completely narrowed in what that exactly will look like. And, uh, I know Caleb, you are not the first choir group who has made that exact same comment, um, which is really important to name again right now, because as we move further on in the process, which probably won't be this phase, but maybe we'll get news from the grantors, um, in the next, day or two or a couple months and we'll do it all. Um, but yeah, we do want to keep that in mind. And I'm wondering even, um, Caleb, um, with your group, like even if, if it would be helpful as we're going along the process, if you wouldn't mind like consulting for us and we can kind of show you some of that stuff and you can give us some feedback on that um, just so that we can make sure we're hitting that um, aspect as well. Yes, please invite us to give feedback on that point. We would love to. Awesome. Nora, did you have something? Yeah, do you guys use the balcony right now? Uh, we do not. Um, I think there could be occasions when we would for certain types of performances, but uh, so far we haven't used it for our uh, concerts or our rehearsals. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, and, and so, 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 so that you know, Caleb, um, we've we've kind of talked about from our church musician perspective, um, kind of like up in the and the balcony space. While we'll take out the built-in risers and pews there, um, that we would also get movable risers so that we could still have the risers there um, on that on that upper level. If you ever did use that up there, is the plan for right now? That's great. That's great. Um, is will the piano likely the piano in the sanctuary likely remain where it currently is? Yeah, it, the, at this point, we don't have any plans to move it. Um, I think we still need to figure out like where, how all these like ramp situations are going to work and, and where that's going to land. But there will, I think our church musician might quit if we take that piano out of there. So there will be a piano there. Uh, <laughs> cool. Okay. Thanks. So with that, um, I'm going to just take us real quickly um, through kind of these next phases um, to talk a little bit about um, the, the 
the whole kit and caboodle. Basically, to do this whole thing, we're looking at like $3.9 million is what um, it all kind of turns out. So that's why we're going to only be able to do some portion. So the next portion, I kind of talked about um, the, these first three ones here, maybe even down to that fourth one. And a lot of that is going to depend on money throughout that process. Um, so we're thinking that this is probably going to be a phase two and a phase three, and there might be a phase four, depending on how those other phases go. Um, and we'll, we'll keep, um, up on that. Um, as I did mention, um, we, we have received some grants already. Um, one of the biggest grants that we got is from, uh, the National Fund for Sacred Places, um, which is a collaboration between the Partners of Sacred Places, Partners for Sacred Places, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. It is, um, the most prestigious and most competitive, um, uh, grant for sacred places in the United States. Um, if you're thinking about places like the National Cathedral, St. Michael's Church in Philadelphia, like, you know, founding, founding fathers and mothers and folks, um, those kind of places receive those grants and Wicker Park is in the same ballpark as that. So this is like absolutely huge for us. 0.9% uh, um, of every um, applicant is invited to apply and only 0.4% are ever funded. And we were funded with a $100,000 uh, one for one matching grant specifically for ADA accessible entryway um, and plus um, a $5,000 planning and grant and technical assistance. So this is absolutely huge for us um, that we're kind of in the ballpark with those uh, kind of big hitters. And what it really shows is that um, we have a historically significant church location and that we're really invested in the community because that's what they're looking for at the end of the day. And so um, it's an affirmation of what you all as space use groups um, and uh, community members have already helped to build here with us. And so um, we couldn't be uh, more excited to, to be recipients of that grant. We also received a $20,000 grant um, in support from uh, the Metropolitan Chicago Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, so our denomination, for the ADA Accessible Entry. And we've put in for um, two rather large grants from the city of Chicago. Some of you have written letters of support for that, and we are very grateful, including the citywide Adopt a Landmark grant. Um, and so we applied for like a $2.99, almost $3 million grant from them um, in June. Um, the largest, though, that they've ever given is like a 1.08. We know we're not going to get the, the 2.99, but we like to get as much as we can out of that because um, they do do portions of it. And so um, Last I heard a few weeks ago, they were still making their way through that and they were going to be announcing in the next few weeks. So keep praying or offering sacrifices or crossing your fingers or whatever you do um, as as we um, hope to, to hear good news from that. Um, and then the Chicago Recovery uh uh, plan community development grant, we applied for a $2.7 million grant for that in August. Um, it's, it's unique in that um, it took them a little bit of time to, to ask if we could uh, if, if we were a good fit for it or not, they had to have some special meetings because we're kind of on this weird edge, but they eventually said, we, th we think that you're actually eligible for it. Go for it. And so, um, supposedly we're supposed to hear back by the end of this year. Um, we will see with that. And that's another one where we could get parts and portions. And so that's really when we were looking at the overall costs, that that's what would accelerate the project. We still are, we have, um, a list of some other grants and our, fundraising consultant is going to help us um, seek more of those out. So our intention is continue to apply for grants, especially for community groups um, and and really anyone. If you know of a grant um, that you think potentially we could apply for, or you're putting in for a grant specifically for your organization that you can also tie in things like ADA accessibility or anything to the actual building structure that you call home so that we can kind of like um, be like a ride along um, of that. Uh, that you could financially um, uh, contribute to these things as well. Please be in conversation um, with with us, with me. Um, we'd be happy to, to help on any of those grants that you're putting in, because um, especially for for an arts community, sometimes there's opportunity for for building um, and infrastructure as well. And so, if we can take advantage of that, we'd love to to piggyback on that and to have a partnership in that. Um, I would also um, say that in, in the process of going through that, we were really excited. We uh, Part of our technical assistance for that big grant that we got from the National Fund was that they came um, uh, on site and they reviewed a whole bunch of our numbers to look at the economic halo impact um, of Wicker Park Lutheran Church. So essentially what they're saying is there is a dollar and cents that you can put on what we do here at this building. Now, it doesn't look at each of the individual groups who are in our building, but just 
Wicker Park Lutheran Church's economic impact. So each of the groups also have their economic impact, but it starts looking at things like our direct spending, um, uh, open space, so like how many people are using our gathering garden, magnet effects, so basically like when people are coming to church or funerals or weddings, like are they stopping at Starbucks and buying a coffee and is that having an economic impact in the neighborhood? Are they going out to Big Star or another, um, you know, the Roby afterwards to get brunch? That's having economic impact in the area with that. Then also individual impact. So you can actually go through and the, the United States government has said, you know, helping to counsel someone and then helping to prevent them from committing suicide has a dollar amount on it. That this is how much economic impact it has on their their friends, their family, their neighbors, the larger. And so, you know, each time that we go through counseling with that or helping to keep families together, so on. So they ask us all these different questions um, with all of that, and they come up with this dollar amount. And so they came up with, um, just from June of last year through May of this year, that we had over $2 million of economic impact in that 12-month period. And I think what's really, really important to do is to put it in context which is when you look at historic urban congregations like ours, the average in across the nation is 1.7 million. And these are congregations that also have like schools and preschools and stuff like that, which we don't have based on our size and location. And we still exceeded that national average. So the amount of like good economic work that is being done dollars and cents wise here at, in Wicker Park Lutheran Church, um, because of what the congregation does and because of what our, our space use partners do is immense. Um, and it exceeds the national average. And so we want to make sure that we say thank you to all of you who are um, our space use partners and also just to, to celebrate um, the amazing work that we're doing for the community here in Wicker Park and beyond. Finally, I know some of you participated um, in our uh, fundraising feasibility study. Um, and so just a few key findings from that also came. We did 36 interviews with members, donors, community members, and space use groups. Um, they were really excited. Um, they came back and said, we're a vibrant congregation serving the world. Um, the, the consultant actually said, like, I, I don't know what I, I was like. Okay, so like, give us, they gave us like a few little things to improve on. And we were kind of moving on those things already. And she said, Honestly, at the end of the day, you guys are like one of the healthiest congregations we've ever done the study for. And, uh, you know, everyone that we talk to, um, can, has identified the things that you've already identified as like things you need to work on. And she's like, communication is flowing great. Fun finances are great. And so they were, they were really, really, um, um, excited. And, and so they from that, um, said that they think that we can raise internally in the congregation about a half million to 600,000, but we're going to go for a campaign of the 1.3 million. And so that's how we get to the, the specific phases that we mentioned before. Um, and so it, it really will need um, a whole variety of support from, from everyone. Uh, so if you know of a granting agency, if you know, as we start launching um, the public phase, if you know some other people who are really passionate about historic architecture and they're passionate about community and stuff like that, we would love um, to get a chance to just talk with them and meet them and share a little bit. Um, and so as we kind of look at timeline, we kind of built this out. It's probably a little bit more for, for the congregation, but just so you kind of know where we're at, we've kind of got two streams that we've got going down right now. And so we're going to move forward. This was schematic design um, that, that we're talking about today here. And so after we finish this meeting, compile all the information, we'll move in design development, construction permitting document, bidding. Um, and as you can see here, it's probably late 2024 um, through 2025, the construction will likely happen. Um, we will be um, going through a, a silent phase um, over the next like uh, three or four months here, where we're going to be doing a lot of behind the scenes and getting things ready to launch more of our public phase. Um, and we're going to be doing ongoing grants um, and submissions. And so um, any ways that, that you can um, help partner with us to, to make the financial side of this turn all of this into a reality, um, we are just really excited to um, hear from you, get connected with people you know, organizations and other places um, where we can, we can leverage some of those things. And so with that, any other final questions about kind of the funding portion, the phasing portion, um, or any of the um, other information that I shared. Beautiful. Well, thank you um, for, for being here with us.
If you come up with something later, feel free to email me. Um, we also have an anonymous comment form that is available at that uh, workerparklutheran.org forward slash buildings. So if you're like, oh, I don't want to say it in here for whatever, you can drop it there anonymously. We'll still get um, all of that feedback um, as well. So um, thank you all online for your time. Thank you for coming next door and uh, have a great night. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye, Caleb. Thank you.